things, I find that ceremony is very important because it really helps to set the, the intent and the context around what you're doing with the medicines. And you can bring ceremony into your everyday life as well. So I will ask everybody to um, close their eyes. And I call this my secular ceremony. I want the atheist to be comfortable as well. So you don't have to fear anything here. But I'm going to close my eyes too. And I'll ask everybody to take a deep breath, put a big smile on their face for no reason, but we're all here together. And Pascal is going to invoke a tone for us. Or not. So I'm going to open up the idea that every single human being that has ever appeared on planet Earth has been cradled by seven directions. And I want to thank and honor these seven directions. We've got the directions that are known symbolically as the compass points, north, south, east, west. On a personal level, it's the direction in front of us, the direction behind us, to the right of us, to the left of us. Thank you. Thank you to these four compass points for holding space for each and every one of us, as well as that direction below us, that earthly direction, and that direction above us, that upward turn, that heavenly direction with so much invisible power within it. So send gratitude to the six directions as we focus on that seventh direction, that inward turn. When you look across the street and you see something, maybe a dog or a tree, you think you're seeing something across the street, but really light is bouncing off of that tree into your eye, getting transmitted into electrical, chemical, maybe spiritual energy. And you actually experience everything within you. So that seventh direction is arguably the most important of all. So we invite that space to open up within us, to allow ourselves to learn something, to join in communion with each other in this sacred event of coming together like this. Thank you to all the directions. Thank you to the five elements. The whole physical universe that we know is made up of five elemental ways of being. We've got the earth element, the building blocks that everything is made from, that material aspect of things. We've got the water element, that soothing, flowing, life-giving water. The fire element, the fire of transformation, let's ask that to show up in full fury today. As well as the air element, the invisible element, but so powerful. We can go a month without food if we really need to, a week without water if we really need to, but we can't go much more than a couple of minutes without that air element. So let's each take another deep breath. Just appreciate that life-giving air. And then focus upon that fifth element, that emptiness. All of those elements that I just listed dance upon a blank canvas. And we so often forget about the empty yet powerful, almost sky-like nature of that fifth element. Clouds in the sky, they come and go. They live, they die, they take on different forms. But that empty sky-like nature, it just sits there. It is the grand meditative immortal nature and we all have relation to that sky-like nature. So let's connect to that great meditative witness to all things. Thank you to each and every one of our ancestors and each and every one of the lineage that we will leave behind us. Thank you to all of our ancestors and all of our relations for everything they did to bring us to this moment. Thank you to the earth itself 
such a great mother and supporter. Thank you to the sun, to the moon, to all of the star nations. Thank you to all of the animal spirits, all of our animal companions. And very importantly, thank you to the plant medicines. Thank you to all of the plant kingdom. They're all medicines in some kind of way. And very specifically, let's thank the sacraments that have brought us together here today. These fascinating psychedelic and entheogenic and sacramental plant compounds. Thank you to all of them. Thank you to everyone who took time to come on this call today. Let's drop in for some great conversation with some great people. I thank you. Om, amen, all my relations. Thank you everybody for showing up here. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. This is very exciting. I want to next move on to engaging with our five fabulous panel members. We have some people who have worked in various ways and understand these psychedelic medicines. And I want to thank each and every one of them for being on here. First of all, Duncan Grady, Salome Tabrizi, Julian Maxwell, Wade Davis, and Dennis McKenna. So I'm going to open up, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions of the panel first of all, and from there, we will open it up to the uh, questions that we're going to ask from the rest of you. And the first question is, again, I, I want to I wanna go through this webinar as if, as if we're having people on here who have never heard about psychedelics as medicines before, or therapeutics before, or sacraments before. Um, the war on drugs was a very successful propaganda campaign. So there's a lot of people who still have a lot of hangups around these substances. So the first thing I'd like everybody to do, and I'll call you out one at a time here, is I'd like you to introduce yourselves and maybe share with us why you are the kind of person that got invited to speak on a webinar like this, the first webinar from the Canadian Psychedelic Association. So I'm going to go in the order that people appear on my screen. And first of all, that is my brother, Duncan Grady, who is coming to us from the, uh, from the Kootenai region of British Columbia, I believe. He is uh, uh, somebody that I look forward to getting to know a little bit more, although we have had some prosperous interactions with each other in the past. But Duncan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this over to you. And I'll suggest to everybody, I'm not sure what kind of view that you've got on um, Zoom, but make sure that you've got speaker view so that you can give all of your attention to Duncan. Off to you, please introduce yourself, sir. Thank you. Th thank you, Trevor. And thank you for that beautiful opening. Um, very heartfelt and very prayerful. <clears throat> so my name is Duncan Grady. And um, uh, I'm not entirely sure, I, I'm delighted to be here, but I'm not entirely sure um, uh, why I was invited to be here. Um, uh, I have a um, strong interest in the plant medicines because of their ceremonial use. Um, uh, the use by both indigenous and non-indigenous people. Um, the elders and the medicine women say that when we put something into our lodge, meaning our body, it goes in and down, pointing us in the direction to go in and down. And the medicine women particularly say that um, the medicine is already in us and the spirit of what we bring into our bodies interacts with that spirit, also called medicine. And that interaction gives us an opportunity to transform what needs our transformation. And in that regard, uh, I place very high regard, very high regard 
in the spirit of the plant medicines and their incredible value and help that they offer us. As Trevor alluded to all the time, but particularly the plant medicines that we're speaking about in this context. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here. All my relations. All my relations. Thank you, Duncan. Next on my screen, I see my dear friend, Salome Tabrizi. If we could pass this off to her to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to everybody who's here and has joined us today. Um, a lot of you are dear friends of mine who I know personally, and I have seen the courage and the determination that you guys have showed in removing and excavating and clearing um, a lot of the blocks that you have had in your own lives and how you showed up as anchors of light during this potent time on our planet. So I just wanna thank all the people who are here and who are doing the work and the people that uh, I don't know yet um, as a member of the Canadian Psychedelic Association, it's my honor um, and it's our honor to serve you and support you fully as you support and serve your communities fully. Um, my journey in the past five years has been in and out of the ceremonial container for ayahuasca. I've been supporting people as a somatic energy therapist within the circle and then as an integration counselor outside. And I believe that this is a very, um, very pivotal time in our time of ascension, as many of us know, and it is a choice. We really are at a point where we have a choice to be in balance and harmony with our planet or uh, choose a different path. And I, um, yeah, I feel that uh, this, I was reflecting on this yesterday. I feel that this is the dieta as many of you who have worked with ayahuasca um, in your own journeys know that there is a preparation period before we even go into ceremony where distractions are taken out, where we take away any of our so-and-so called coping mechanisms of sugar and salt and uh, sexual contact and meat to be able to be as open as possible to enter the ceremony, ceremonial container. And I feel that because of the virus or whatever this light is showing us, we actually have had a chance to be in an isolation dieta. And whoever is on the planet at this time, I feel has chosen to go on this journey. And now it's no longer an individual or a group journey. We are all going through and we'll be going through a entheogenic earth psychedelic journey. And it's one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging um, ceremony of our life. So, but we've all chosen to be here and I look forward to explore this through the visions that I've received and the visions that other members of the community have received and what we are being asked to do and to be. Beautiful. Thank you, sister. And next on my screen, I see Wade Davis, sir. If we could have him step forward and please introduce yourself and uh, share why you might have been invited onto something uh, like sure, this. Sure, Trevor. Thank you very much. My, uh, my name is Wade Davis. I, I come at this very differently, I suppose, because I, uh, I'm an academic and an anthropologist. Uh, and I'm very much in that lineage of Richard Evans Schultes, the man who sort of sparked the psychedelic era in the 1930s with his discovery of the um, psychoactive mushrooms in Oaxaca. And, you know, I, I sort of step back. I, I, some of the language that I've heard already on this, um, on this gathering uh, is almost um, reverential in a, in a sense of, of a true believer in a kind of syncretic, somewhat appropriated religiosity, if you will, I don't really come at it like that. I come as a celebrant of, of culture, not of plants per se. Um, you know, the, the, the fundamental desire to uh, periodically invoke some technique of ecstasy to transcend the ordinary and achieve some alternate state of reality is so ubiquitous in the uh, ethnographic record that you have to really see it as part of the basic human appetite. 
And how that appetite is, is satisfied, it ranges across the planet in any number of ways. Um, it can be meditation, it can be ordeal, it can be um, uh, the extremes of, of, of dance, or it can be these curious plants. And one of the most remarkable anomalies in botanical science is that of the roughly 120 known uh, entheogenic plants, fully 95% are from the Americas, not because of forests of equatorial West Africa or, or of uh, uh, Southeast Asia were depauperate, or that the people there didn't, as natural philosophers, explore their environment for biodynamic substances. It's just that the people there had other avenues to the divine. And so the use of these plants is just one doorway to the gods, if you will. But in the Americas, it is a predominant doorway. And, and the, the impact, Trevor uh, encouraged us to speak to those who have not sort of been engaged and worked with these plants. Uh, the fantastic thing about the influence of the psychoactive agents on the human imagination is that they invoke a state that is so otherworldly that it's no surprise whatsoever that in most cultures, these substances are seen to be spiritual arrows to the divine, or in some cases, gods incarnate. And the effects are so otherworldly that they're almost difficult to describe. Gordon Wasson, who was the first to actually ingest mushrooms in ritual context in, uh, with the Mazatec, in 1956 famously wrote that trying to explain the subjective effects of these substances is like trying to explain to a blind man what it is to see. But the easiest or the best way to try to give you a sense of what the subjective um, sense of taking San Pedro or, or ayahuasca is very different, but the sense one has or can have is that that world, that's that world of spiritual fusion, a, a kind of energetic radiance of resonance suddenly begins to feel like you, that to you that that real is the real world and the world of the ordinary level of consciousness where we live our day-to-day -day lives, the mundane world of ordinary reality, if you will, suddenly seems from that perspective to be a rather crude facsimile of something that we can reach by means of these remarkable plants. And that's why they've had such a central place in culture because to heal the body, the shaman has to invoke some technique of ecstasy to get into those spiritual realms where he or she can work their deeds of magical, mystical, medical rescue. And these plants become the avenue to the Godhead. And that's what makes them so remarkable. And I've been studying these plants you know, indirectly since I first took ayahuasca in 1973. Um, but I very much are from the school of thought, if you will, like Ram Dass, you get the message you hang up. There's another whole way of working with these plants, which is sort of a personal journey that we've heard, obviously, from Duncan and others, which is another option. But I want to stress that, that you don't have to enter this sort of uh, devotional track um, of, of recurrent use of these substances to have your life transformed by them. In fact, I, I would argue that when you look back at the extraordinary sea change that occurred in my lifetime, uh, whereby women went from the kitchen to the boardroom, uh, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the uh, closet to the altar, where suddenly we began to think of Gaia, when we began to use language like biodiversity, when suddenly the, the fact that we're you know, biological beings on a living planet suddenly became part of the reality. The one thing that we always expunge from the record of that social transformation is the fact that tens of millions of us um, at very formative stages in our lives lay prostrate before the gates of awe having ingested one of these remarkable plants. Now, I would be the first to say that I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't understand mythology as I do. I wouldn't understand cultural relativism. I wouldn't treat women. I wouldn't understand nature. I wouldn't understand the gay life uh, had I not taken these substances. When, when, when I was young, 
our parents used to always say to us, you know, don't take these things, you'll never come back the same. And of course, what they didn't understand is that was a whole bloody point. And so one of the things that I think we need to begin to uh, um, encourage people to understand is the pivotal, useful, incredibly helpful role that these plants have already played in our modern society, if you will. And that is a role that was cut off at the knees by the draconian legislation brought in in the wake of the war on drugs. And now we finally have an opening where just possibly the extraordinary potential of these substances for clinical practice, for therapy, for research uh, in any number of dimensions may finally, after 40 or 50 years, have the chance to be realized. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Wade. So honored to have you on this call. Next, I see my dear friend Jillian Maxwell on my screen. If we could hear from her, please. I see that you're muted. Now you're unmuted. Oh, no, you're still muted. Maybe I can unmute you. I think I'm unmuted now, am I? Yeah, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for unmuting me. And um, thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. I'm really proud of uh, founding member of the Canadian Psychedelic Association. And um, so I think the question is sort of, why would I be on this panel? And um, I guess uh, my experience uh, for many years um, was in drug policy reform and harm reduction um, at the late 1990s and early 2000s and working in Vancouver in the downtown east side and um, advocating for changing drug policy and advocating against the war on drugs. And, and in that um, context, I met many wonderful people, um, friends and colleagues, and, and was introduced to the idea of, um, of entheogens and psychedelics as a tool. And um, I um, had never really been that interested. I grew up in England. I just missed the 60s. I was still in school. Like I, I just wasn't in my psyche at all. And maybe I, I tried cannabis three times, wasn't that interested in that. And so somebody explained ayahuasca to me and I went, oh, I want to do that. That's for me. And um, that was in 2003, went to Peru and did a dieta in 2004 and have been um, actually, unlike um, Wade, um, working, I, I feel, working with uh, the grandmother Ayahuasca for many years um, as a teacher. She's a teacher for me and I'm very grateful for the patience she's had with me, with the many parts of my being and personality that she has helped shape and open up. And, and I think before my uh, experience with psychedelics, I would say life was pretty ordinary. And, um, and I would hear people talk about being grateful for being alive. And I didn't really get that. Uh, just I was this woman and I was doing these things. And then a whole world of um, gratitude and uh, a whole world of connection has opened up for me as a result of working with Plan. And I'm really grateful for that, the connection and a sense of there's so much more than this, this, there's so much more. Um, and that we are all connected in all those levels. And to see those levels is just very, for me, it's always been very comforting and, uh, and reaffirming. And so I'm very grateful for my existence. I'm grateful to be here at this moment, at this very big moment in time for humanity. And um, that's why I'm on this panel. Cool, thank you so much. And happy birthday, Jillian. Oh. <laughs> A whole bunch of people in the comments have been saying happy birthday. Oh. Thank you. I almost promised that we wouldn't all sing happy birthday to you, but we'll see how no, that don't. <laughs> It'll here. blow the circuits for sure. <laughs> awesome, thanks Jillian. And next we have, uh, Mr. Dennis McKenna, an honor to have you on this call as well. If you could please give us a brief introduction of yourself and how you came into this world. He's still muted too. Okay, now you can hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. 
All right, well, I am honored to be invited to this group. Uh, this is rather an amazing gathering, and I think the, uh, the social effects that this forum may have uh, can hardly be estimated, but it, it's very good to see this happening. Uh, I am an ethnopharmacologist. Uh, like Wade, I have approached uh, psychedelic uh, medicines from the perspective of science, uh, while Wade is an anthropologist. I'm more or less of a uh, botanist, uh, not a very good botanist, I guess, but <laughs> an ethnobotanist. Don't ask me to identify a plant, please. Uh, I more relate to uh, plants on the level of chemistry. And uh, I hear almost everyone saying in this forum how grateful they are to be involved with psychedelics. And I would, I would have to say the same, that uh, psychedelics, uh, particularly ayahuasca and mushrooms, uh, have influenced my life since earliest days, since I was a teenager. And honestly, I'd have to say that almost everything interesting that's happened in my life in some ways I owe to psychedelics, not necessarily to the experiences, although those have been very meaningful, but also to the places it's taken me, the adventures I've had, the people I've met. You know, it's a wonderful group of people that choose to uh, make plant medicines a part of their lives. I think we're all incredibly blessed. These are, uh, these are healing medicines, not only for individuals, but also for the planet and for the species. And as a species, we are wounded. You cannot live in this culture without being traumatized. Plant medicines are medicines for the soul, I believe. Not only the individual soul, but the, the collective soul of our species possibly if we listen to their message, possibly for the healing of the entire planet. One of the very frequent, almost invariable insights that people receive from their experiences with ayahuasca or, mush or mushrooms is an understanding of our dependence on nature. Mm -hmm and our symbiotic relationship, not just with psychoactive plants, but with the entire community of species. We've forgotten this in the Western world. We, uh, our, our Western perspective has been poisoned basically by 2000 years of the Abrahamic religions, which has taught us that we are dominant in nature. Nature exists to serve us and we're perfectly entitled to exploit it, extract from it, ultimately destroy it. We see the consequences of that attitude happening today as the planet spirals ever more, ever more rapidly toward environmental collapse on a planetary scale. Plant medicine send us, send us a message to wake up. We have to re-understand our relationship to the rest of nature. We have to realize that we are not in control. We're part of nature and we need to learn how to work in harmony with nature. And that's, that's what symbiosis is about. And if the plant medicines don't send us that message, I think the COVID virus is again, giving us an abrupt wake up call, reminding the monkeys that we are not running the show. Nature is running the show. And nature will take whatever steps it needs to take to protect itself. And I think we're getting a not so rude wake up call from the virus. That is, it could have been much worse, but I think nature is not without kindness. And it's giving it an, oppor an opportunity to say, to realize that we have to make big changes in terms of the way that we relate to nature. And I think that the plant medicines, which uh, Jillian referred to as plant teachers, and, and they often are, uh, that's one way to look at it. But they are attempting to open our eyes to our current existential situation. 
And it's a lesson that we very much need to learn. And I think that we need to, it's important to do this work for, first of all, to recognize that plant medicines are, you know, the, the, decriminal, the decriminalization movements that are happening now are very encouraging. What is sobering and, and dismaying to me is the fact that they're even necessary. You know, the very idea that you could criminalize another organism, you know, and declare that it has no right to exist on the surface of the earth. These plants are not the small smallpox virus. You know, they're valuable plant medicines that have a, a role in many, many cultures, these so-called psychedelic medicines or drugs of abuse and so on. It's not the chemical and pharmacological properties of these plants. It's the way that they're used that is either beneficial or harmful. And that's a human decision. The plants simply are what they are. They have the properties that they have. It's up to us to learn how to use them properly for healing, to bring it ourselves together with each other, to re-understand our, our connection to nature, and to just try a little bit of humility for a change. Realize that, you know, we are monkeys, we're not running the show, and we need to wake up. And I think plants are the best catalysts to come to that realization that we have. So I'm very grateful to uh, be involved, to have had plant medicines as a gift in my life. I'm very grateful to be working with such amazing people as there are in this forum. And I hope that together we can shift global consciousness. Uh, and the plant medicines are a catalyst for that. I seem to be disappearing in and out of space. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's new. It works. Yeah. It works. It's new, it works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> but anyway, that that uh, that is the message. And so I'm very happy to to be involved in this. You know, I think what we need to understand is any relationship with another organism that benefits both organism, it, or, organisms should be encouraged. So symbiosis is the key word, cooperation for mutual benefit between different organisms. And that, you know, that kind of relationship with plant medicines is what's happening. But any, anything that you value, food plants, uh, you know, plants you use for textiles, all kinds of things, that's all about symbiosis. Symbiosis is much more important in the dynamics of, of the biosphere than competition. Uh, the whole survival of the fittest, that, that's a part of it, but that's not the main part that defines it. What, what advances life is, the, is when species cooperate. We've forgotten that. We've decided that species exist to serve us. This is incredibly arrogant and we're about to get, in fact, we are getting a rather brutal wake up call on that assumption. You know, the COVID virus is also a messenger from Gaia and uh, we should be grateful for it because it's, it's more or less forcing us to step back a little bit and actually quite a bit and rethink what our relationship is going to be going forward, what our relationship to nature will be going forward if nature permits us uh, to do that. So thank you. I'm, I'm very Beautiful. happy to participate in this. Thanks so much, Dennis. Wow. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I would like to encourage everybody, I'm only going to ask one or two more questions here of the panel and then we'll open it up to you. So whether you're on Facebook or you're on the Zoom itself, you can pose questions through there. Then we've got uh, Pascal and Mark, who will be forwarding them to me. I saw a couple questions already that I can answer quickly around some of the things Dennis said. Uh, one of the questions is, what can we do in Canada towards helping decriminalization? You can go to decriminalizenature.ca and leave your email address there, because in just a few days, we are launching a petition that has teeth. It actually will get to the government we can promise you that, but the more signatures, the better. And we're working towards decriminalizing all plant medicines. The other question is what can we do to help the legitimization of these medicines 
in Canada. And that's kind of what we're doing with the Canadian Psychedelic Association in our humble way. And the way that you can support the Canadian Psychedelic Association is we are just announcing right now for the first time that we have our first way of supporting us, which is called the Friends of the CPA. And if you go to psychedelicassociation.net and press on memberships, there's either a $50 option or a $100 option. $50 is for students and for lower income. But we're going to try and provide a lot of value to people as friends of the CPA. Out of the gate, what you get for that is, number one, you get to support the webinars that we're going to be putting on. This is the first of many. We've got another one coming up probably on May 13th, and it isn't 100% confirmed yet, but it's confirmed enough that I'm going to mention his name. It looks like Paul Stamets is going to be on that one with us. So um, the other thing that your donation and support will go towards is the decriminalization petition. We're going to put a lot of hours into promoting the decriminalization petition because we think it's a really good way to get the word out. And then in return, you will receive from the Spirit Plant Medicine community, the uh, Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, they are giving you 15% off their conference, which is upcoming. You also get 15% off the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum to watch that online, as well as 20% off the Catalyst Calgary conference, conference, which is coming up at the end of May. That will be online as well. So we're going to try and keep adding value to that Friend of the CPA package. Please consider joining us in that. And then you also get three free months into what he calls the Netflix of spirit plant medicine, which is the back end of the spirit plant medicine website, which has every single talk that ever has happened at the spirit plant medicine conference, including Wade and Dennis have both spoken there before and uh, you get access to that. So please consider joining that. And for the next question, I'm going to the really, the, the inspiration for this webinar in particular was what can the psychedelic context, what can what we've learned from either cultures who use psychedelics or from our own personal experiences or from having seen transformation in other people, what can the psychedelic context do to inform what is happening on earth right now with this COVID-19 and quarantine and the, the transformation that seems to be happening and the, the waking up that seems to be happening for a lot of people and or the fear that a lot of people seem to be weighed down by because of what's happening right now. So that's the question I'd like to pose to the panelists now is what can these medicines and the psychedelic context do to inform the times that we're facing right now? And I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Duncan to go first if he doesn't mind. Sure, happy to. Um, uh, I'm, I didn't mention this before. I'm an elder in the circle of Indigenous Nations Society uh, here in the West Kootenays. Um, there are many elders and medicine women who view this time that we're in as um, a rite of passage, an initiation, if you will. Um, If one views it that way, the plant medicines can, um, if we allow it, uh, can help us to perhaps see a bigger picture of what's going on. So that instead of the question, when will things get back to normal? we begin wondering if I can hold this as a rite of passage. And since all rites of passage, at least from an indigenous perspective, are about um, changing how we view failure. And instead of viewing it as failure, being curious about what it's teaching us about ourselves individually and about ourselves collectively. And as has already been said by many of the panelists, 
one of the benefits of the plant medicines, um, again, if we allow it, um, is the recognition of how I separate myself, not only from myself, but perhaps from everything, and how the rite of passage shows us our own interconnection, however one chooses to view that, our own interconnection. So at this time in particular, from my perspective, um, that's one of the many ways that the plant medicines can be assisting us. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Duncan. And I'll, I'll ask the same question to Salome. What, what do you think the psychedelic context can do to inform these times we're facing right now? Thank you. Thank you to all of you for sharing thus far. Um, I always just go back to what I received in the ceremonial space. And, you know, I, I feel that right now we can learn and we've all been in this training uh, when we have worked with psychedelics and entheogens, that when we take that sacrament and we are in that ceremony, what we learn is to fully surrender. Because when we don't surrender, we get dragged. And it's so important in the ceremonial space to keep the anchor in breath and to keep the anchor in the focus of your thoughts, because We've all been in those situations where we've had challenging or quote unquote bad trips. And the lesson in the ceremonial space is to surrender to the will of spirit and to be fully present with everything that comes up because there is no escaping. And I feel that we are, as Dennis was mentioning, a traumatized culture, a runaway culture, we are either in fight or flight or freeze. And this is such an opportunity, um, an incredible gift to be at the forefront of, of this ascension process. Because again, Buddhist monks in the inquiry of mind for 2,500 years have been trying to, through meditation, get to these states of, um, of expansion and clarity and calm and serenity. And so I feel that plants are an accelerated way to access these states. And so for what? I think, why? Why, why is ayahuasca spreading through the globe at this time? Why are the psilocybin um, energies coming through so strong? Why is San Pedro grounding us in our heart? And why is cannabis balancing our bodies um, and helping us to let go of our pain and be able to sleep better and to help emotionally regulate. So um, I'm going to share a vision that I've had at the World Ayahuasca Conference um, last year uh, where Wade Dennis both spoke at and it was amazing to hear you both, Jillian and I were there as well with, um, uh, with uh, Richard, Jillian's partner. And I wanna just say thank you to the ICRS team for your impeccable service in bringing that conference together and allowing the 2000 or so individuals and the greater community to have a historical moment like that in celebration and reverence. And when I was at that conference, I had a chance to sit with Alex Polari, who is a maestro in the Santo Daime tradition. And during that ceremony, um, it was nine hours long, very long. And I just had visions and visions of the mass deaths of individuals, of brothers and sisters on the planet. And again, please don't believe anything I say, only take what resonates with you. Um, it's just a subjective experience. But um, I've, again, had visions of the buildings in LA imploding. I've had visions of being in Hawaii, looking at Vancouver and Falls Creek going under tsunamis. But this ceremony was very different. It was about the, the deaths and the, the passing of so many millions of individuals. And I just cried and cried and cried. And I know many of us have had these similar visions. And in that ceremony, two things became very clear. One was that enlightenment as we know it is about survival in this time. And so how do we survive as a species? How do we move past into what many of the prophecies have said is the golden 
era is the golden time of human consciousness. Can we make it? So this is the human experience, the human experiment. And what I saw in that and what Madre showed me was that enlightenment, so being in non-judgment, full acceptance, total trust and surrender of your will to the higher self is what's necessary to be able to transition through this time. And the one thing that gets in the way of that is to lose our connection with ourself. And so many people on the planet right now, because they're in fight or flight or freeze, are not even in their bodies. So that's what the plants are helping us to do, to come back into the temple, to take care of the temple first, and then we can take care of our greater temple. And she said that in order to do this, there was no dissociation. So the fear that is coming up, we need to be able to fear it, uh, feel it and allow the fear to be there, but also not become it. And so she said two pieces, and, and Wade, you've, we've, you've talked a lot about the rituals of many different cultures. You talked about going to Colombia and visiting with indigenous there who hold the heart of the heart of the planet and their rituals, their devotion to those rituals is so important. And the Western culture, I feel, um, is implementing more of these rituals. And so the ritual of grief and the ritual of prayer, which is so important for us right now. We have created spaces where we come to be with the medicine. Now, a lot of us have cleared enough to just be in silence and in prayer and also have a place where we come and grieve together. I come from a culture, I'm Iranian by birth, and I see my family in Iran right now and what they're going through with Corona and what it's going through as far as sanctions and what is happening just, just to them in the suffocation. And yet they still come together in prayer and they still come together in community. And so I know that we have an opportunity to do the same um, and many of the prophecies, again, have said that they are waiting for the white brother to come back. They're waiting for the white race to wake up. This is on Prophecy Rock. The Hopi traditions talk about the two paths that we have. Either we go into the unity consciousness of harmony with the world, with the earth, or we perish. And so I will... The next uh, time I have an opportunity to speak, I would like to link it to the geopolitical situation that we're facing and um, what is potentially going to happen in the next two to five years and what solutions we have as, as a race. Because I feel that, again, with Corona, this is the last thing I mentioned, with the coronavirus, it has been a miracle because the governments we saw, it didn't have to go to Senate didn't have to go to House of Commons. It didn't have to go to the federal level for all these red tapes for them to make a stop. The factory stopped, travel stopped, everything stopped. The world started to shift. We saw more dolphins, more turtles. We've seen clarity of pollution. In one month, look how the earth regained her healing. And so I feel now that if we wanted to do this and we wanted to reshift, there are options and the geopolitical situation is one thing and then the geoengineering thing is one thing and then our consciousness and being able to move from within and create the world that we want to see and step out of this trance and step into a different kind of trance is readily available to us and empowerment is key beautiful thank you so much salome such wisdom thank you and wade well, Salome, I really liked what you said. I, you know, I, I, let me again step back. It's always helpful to try to understand where this is coming from. You know, cultures tend to be myopic and the idea is that my way is the real way and everybody else is a uh, failure to be me. Uh, and so cultures often don't think of themselves have, as a, having emerged from their own history, but we do. And if you really want to understand why it is that we treat the world as we do, you only have to go back to the enlightenment and, and that moment when in our effort to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith, uh, we, we, we flung away and, and to liberate the individual from the collective, which was a sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. We threw away all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, and most importantly, metaphor. Uh, and so, the, so, so as René Descartes said that all that exists is, is mind and matter, in a single gesture, he deanimated the world. 
uh, science made a house cleaning of belief. The triumph of secular materialism became the very conceit of modernity. The idea that the flight of a hawk could have meaning, that, 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 uh, that, that uh, the spirit could have resonance was ridiculed, uh, dismissed as, as ridiculous. Uh, and, and, and that really explains how it is that we came to see ourselves as the solitary players on a stage that was surrounded by props only to support our own destiny. And I want to stress as an anthropologist that that way of thinking is, is not only not common, it's completely anomalous. There are 7,000 voices of humanity, 7,000 languages which reflect the the, the, the essence of a culture coming into the material world. The vast majority of cultures have a very different notion of the interaction between themselves and the natural world. Uh, it, it's not based on a self-conscious or a sentimental notion of attachment, but on a far more subtle intuition. And that is the idea that the world and the earth only exist because it's filtered through the human imagination. Human beings aren't the problem their essential part of the solution. Almost all cultures have an, a notion of reciprocity with the natural world, whereby the world owes us its bounty, we have ritual obligations to the world. Now, why is this so important? I get back to the word metaphor. You know, if I'm raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined, I'm gonna have a different relationship to it than if I'm raised to believe that it's a deity that will direct my destiny. If I was raised in the forests of British Columbia to believe that those forests existed to be cut, I'm gonna have a different relationship to them than say the Kwakwakawak who believe those forests are the boat of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven that must be embraced during the Hamatsa initiation. So metaphor has actually determined our relationship to the natural world for most of our history and in most of our cultures. That's why when you go into the Northwest Amazon, to the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimukos, you don't see Yahe used as a, as a catalyst for an individual journey. It's used by the collective for a collective experience whereby the entire community of men will in, in, in take on the sacred medicine, not become symbols of the ancestors, but become literally the ancestors and co journey collectively to all the points of origin, reaffirming their most fundamental intellectual and spiritual intuition. And that is the idea that plants and animals are only people in another dimension of reality. Now, the point isn't to say, are they right? Are they wrong? It's to pay attention to the metaphor and how that then creates a different way of thinking and a different way of interacting with the earth. Now, for those of us who are uh, the products of this Western uh, way of thinking, if you will, uh, th this, this sort of industrial experiment that has for three centuries now stolen the ancient sunlight of the world, fueled itself on that sunlight that has brought us to this point, uh, it's very difficult to crack open the sky. It's difficult to break open the mind and then suddenly you can take the cactus, you can take the mushroom. In whatever context you choose to do so, always being cognizant of the importance of set and setting, recognizing as Dennis said, that these plants have a totally ambivalent potential for good or evil. It's all about the, the space in which you take them, but that experience can literally in a moment break open the sky and give you this path to another way of being. And that is probably in practical terms, I would say their most valuable lesson is that they teach everyone who takes them in the proper context, surrounded by love in the space of the spirit, you cannot help but come away with a deeper understanding of the miraculous wonder of nature itself. You know, we, 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 we memorize pop tunes, we, 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 we recite religious cant, but how many people uh, can give you the simple formula of life? How many people in this audience know the formula of photosynthesis? You know, the very idea um, 
that, that, that carbon dioxide and water sparked by photons of light can give us carbohydrate and oxygen. That is the, the verse of, of, of life. And yet we, most of us don't even realize that, can't even recite it. I remember, you know, when, when some of these books came out in the 70s saying that plants loved human touch and, and, and listening to Mozart, I used, my friend Tim used to say, why do plant give a shit about Mozart? And even if it did, why should that impress us? They can eat light, isn't that enough? So in other words, we can't have a new way of thinking about the natural world and our place in it and our obligations to it if we don't even understand it on a biological level, but also on an experiential and indeed spiritual level. And I think that these substances uh, are, are the perfect conduit to the divine. These are the substances that in a morning can transform a life. In a moment can open one's eyes, can take you literally through the doorways of the gods into a place where you understand at last, where you embrace at last. And then you can choose to pursue a path of healing using these sacred medicines. You can take them a dozen, 30 times in your life as a young man, be transformed and move on with your life, which was a path that I took. But that catalytic transformation can not be achieved in any other more efficient, more dramatic, or more profound way. Wow, thank you, Wade. Wow. Um, same question to you, my friend Jillian, the birthday girl. It is, what can psychedelics and the context that they give us do to inform these challenging times we're facing right now? If Jillian is still on there. Don't immediately see her. She might have fallen off for some reason. Yeah, nor do I. Okay, great. So let's put that same question to you, Dennis. Okay. Uh, yeah, th thanks for. No, uh, now we got Jillian. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Jillian, you got bumped. I, I get, <laughs> I get to answer because you were a wall. <laughs> <laughs> let's spotlight Dennis and. Okay, so, well, first of all, Wade, I wanted to thank you for sharing those thoughts. I mean, you are one of the most articulate and poetic, I guess, enunciators of this point of view that I've ever had the privilege to, to hear, to work with. I'm so grateful for all you've done for the community and for indigenous communities around the world. You're a tough act to follow. I don't know what I could say to, to top what you already said. I do want to remind people uh, that Wade has written over 22 books. One that you must read is called One River, Explorations and Discoveries in the Amazon. It's the best nonfiction book ever written about the Amazon, in my opinion. Uh, also a movie that came out recently called The Path of the Anaconda. It's on Netflix, well worth, uh, well worth watching. It's an amazing movie. And uh, he has a new book coming out, which I can't wait to delve into called Magdalena, The River of Dreams, which is kind of a love, love story of his uh, relationship to Colombia which is a country that's meant a lot in his life. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Wade that he is my friend and that we've had a chance to work together and, and we'll continue to work together. Thanks, Dan, it's so kind of you. Uh, it's sincerely meant, Wade. Uh, I greatly admire you and I love you. I love you and, too, man. Uh, as far as what to say, I think other people have said it very well. These you know, indigenous people refer to these medicines as plant teachers. And you can read all sorts of anthropomorphism into that. Often ayahuasca is referred to as she, and that's okay if that works for you. But I think it's important to remember that plants are intelligent. 
I think all of life is intelligent. The entire biosphere is sometimes called Gaia. That's another projection. But the biosphere as a whole is a super organism and it's intelligent. In fact, intelligence permeates all levels of existence. And the plant medicines offer a lens through which we can view that, for which we can actually see and experience that. Because our Western background, are, are especially in the modern West, we are proud of our science, we're proud of our literacy, but we've had to make sacrifices to, uh, you know, in, in service of that. And we've missed a lot. You know, we've had to give up this more holistic understanding of nature, which is just built into the indigenous perspective, you know, uh, and we have to relearn it because we've separated ourselves from nature. And science, uh, you know, has, uh, science teaches us that nature is dead, that the entire universe mm. is dead. There's nothing in nature that has meaning. You know, it's just atoms randomly running around, smashing into each other, and that's all there is to it. This attitude has also crept into medicine. The idea that, you know, we're just complex machines. For 150 years, medicine has been attempting to exorcise the spirit out of nature, out of human nature. It's, it's medicine is very reductionist. You know, we're just complex machines. You apply the right molecular monkey wrench and it can fix whatever's wrong with you. And it's led to this over-reliance on what you might call pharmacotherapy and looking at it from that perspective. And I think one of the, uh, one of the laudatory effects that psychedelics have had it, the reintroduction of psychedelics into medicine as a serious option is it forces medicine to take another look at this model because these are medicines that treat the spirit. They're medicines that treat the soul and the body. And these things are not separate. This, this mind-body dichotomy is a legacy of Cartesian dualism. It's not true. You know, we are a mind-body system. You can't separate those things. So, you know, what affects the body affects the mind and vice versa. So that's, I think that's the, really the, maybe one of the biggest gifts to, uh, that the psychedelics have brought to medicine is this new perspective that, you know, they are, they can be used to treat both mind and body and also their learning tools. The psychedelics are lenses that bring the background forward. They give you the tools to go into a natural environment and notice things that are always there, mm -hmm. but you don't always see them. We're conditioned not to see them. It's this old default mode network that Robin Carhart Harris talks about. There's a, there's a word for this in neuroscience. It's called neural gating. You know, and we construct a model of the world. We construct a model of the world. We take in sensory information through our portals, our eyes and ears and so on. We mix that up with assumptions, memories. It goes through a process. And what we do is we create what I sometimes call the reality hallucination. Hmm. It's not the real world. It's a model of the real world, you know, and, and the, you know, in the, in the current, you know, uh, popular uh, psychedelic jargon, this is called the default mode network, but it, it's the same thing. Psychedelics lower this neural gating. You know, that we construct the model of the world and we have to filter almost everything out because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. We wouldn't be able to process it. So what we get is a very impoverished model of reality that we live in and we almost have to in order to, to navigate this reality. Well, indigenous people are not so chained to it because mm -hmm. for one thing, 
you know, in, in truly indigenous situation, they're often not literate, you know, and we think, well, that's a shame, you know, they can't read, how terrible. But actually, in some ways, in order to be literate, you have to have a point of view. They don't have point of views in the way that we do. They are more holistically integrated into their, you know, there is no difference between the foreground and the background. You know, and that's why indigenous people know so much more about processes going in, going on in nature because they simply observe them. They see them. It's not that it's, we don't see them. It's not that they're not there. We're just programmed not to see them. And so in a sense, we miss a lot about the way the world works. And, you know, this is, this is something that, uh, you know, psychedelic can, temporarily lower these gating mechanisms so you can let this information in. And if you let it in, you can get insights into how things work. This is why, for example, Kerry Mullis, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for his invention of the, of the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which is right now so important because of the, of the COVID virus, he was very honest and upfront when he got the Nobel Prize. He said, LSD gave me the insights about how this works. With the help of LSD, I was able to get down with the molecules and see what mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that psychedelics are a lens through which we can examine the external world and see processes going on in nature that were never going, that we never knew were there, you know, because we had we were working within this framework. So psychedelics are learning tools, they're healing tools, uh, and they're also messengers. You know, in, in the, the biosphere is, it works through feedback loops and, and you know, signal transduction. Signal transduction is a process that permeates biology. Signal transduction, as you can tell, has to do with transmitting information, transmitting signals, but it's a special kind of signal transduction that involves a chemical process, a molecule attaching to the outside of a cell. And so it's a biological process and that's, that's what happens. Uh, you know, when you take psychedelics, that, that, that process also permeates, permeates nature. So, you know, you can, you can, you know, you can experience these kinds of signal transduction processes and it can open up portals that are normally closed to you and you can use that as a learning, learning opportunity. And when you do that, you can perceive much more. The world is not what we think it is. You know, we're living in a model of the world, mm -hmm. a hallucination, if you will. And uh, once we disable that hallucination, which is very convenient on a day-to-day -day basis, but occasionally we need to demolish that hallucination temporarily and experience the unfiltered data, if you will, the unfiltered information that comes in from the world and, and see what's there. Because not only is re reality not, what, not the way you think it is, but it's much more marvelous, more complicated, more charged with meaning than you ever imagined. And psychedelics give us the opportunity to experience that. I feel sorry for people that never give themselves that opportunity uh, because if they could, they'd be much more grateful for, for the world that we live in, which is really pretty miraculous when you think about it. So thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. And now, Jillian, same question to you. What can psychedelics do to inform, what does the psychedelic context do to inform the times that we're facing now, these very interesting times? Thank you. Am I, uh, says I'm, am I muted still? No, nope, you're good. Oh, great. Thank you. I'm so glad. Um, well, there's so many things to say. Um, first of all, I, uh, want, I, I want to take it to the personal. I want to take it to everybody that's sitting there watching us who may be sitting in isolation and maybe uh, really feeling nervous and 
angry or upset or afraid or depressed or whatever, uh, not okay. And what I want to talk about today is what I've learned from uh, using psychedelics and what they have taught me. And, um, and so I would begin to say that, um, as uh, uh, Salome said a little earlier, the the thing, the most important thing of anything in a, an experience with a psychedelic is surrender. And my very, very first experience with ayahuasca, a wise woman said to me, you just have to remember these two, th two words, yes and thank you. And that is, for people that have never had um, an experience with a psychedelic, it can be many things. And from time to time, it can be very busy, it can be quite crazy, there'd be maybe things to look at and things are going on and wow. And so what do you do with all of that? And the word, the, the, the advice I got and the thing to do is to come into uh, groundedness and just go, okay, yes, I'm really very grateful for this and I accept it, yes and thank you. And so if we bring that to this moment right now, wherever you are, if you're just stuck somewhere and you feel stuck, um, if you could just shift it into what is this moment about? What is the potential? What is the highest purpose of this moment? And saying yes and thank you to it, accepting that it's like this and actually feeling gratitude. So we're in isolation as Salome and others have said already. Um, it's not being locked up and until we're ready to be free again and do all the usual things we usually do. It's a moment in time for us to go inside and reflect. And um, that is the way to shift it, to reframe it from, I can't wait to get out of here, I'm going crazy. Um, I have a few ideas about um, what I do with myself. Um, so, over the past while I have been um, angry and I have been uh, sad and, and afraid. And, um, and when I get afraid, I, get, I start to get into wanting to control everything to make myself feel safe. And when that, you know, and I think everybody knows that sort of energy inside of themselves where they're not, uh, things aren't okay and they're just not who they usually are and not in their graciousness. Um, and so I've actually been working with, I'm, I'm sharing this because it's been very helpful for me and I want to share it in, 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 in service. Um, so I've been working with a part of myself called control and I have conversations with that part of myself and I talk with her and ask her what all this is about and what, how can I help and how can we work together rather than um, her trying to control me and, and things just don't work very well in that way and I'm, I'm afraid. And so we've worked out quite a few things in the last few weeks. And I would never have done that in that busy world that I had a month ago and before. But I'm with me and myself a lot. And so I'm slowing down. I'm watching my reactions to things. I'm looking at my shadow. And that's really, I think, the biggest opportunity of this moment is to open that door where the shadow lives and get to know the parts of myself that I'm usually way too distracted to bother about an occasion they come up and kind of jump out when you least expect them and mm, I'll just put that back you know in the closet again and so I've been taking this opportunity and I really want to um, encourage you to see it that way that is it's a moment to see who you are get to know yourself get to actually feel gratitude and love for who you are even those bits that are not what not really what you want to project to the world at large, not what you feel are your best. They're there for a reason. They feel that they are serving you. So get to know them and ask them to help you in moving forward rather than shutting them away. Um, are we going to be doing some other another question, Trevor? I, I we're going to take other things. We're going to take questions from the uh, from the audience. We've got a bunch that okay. have come in already that will. But, but so take I, as much I'm as just, you need there. Okay. It's your, it's so, your birthday. It's my birthday. Well, <laughs> I'm hoping this is in service to people because I just feel so blessed that I'm in a beautiful place with my husband, the love of my life. It's also our wedding anniversary today. And oh. you know, I, it's just, it's an amazing moment for me to be with him and we share all of this together. But I don't know what it's like to be in a room or in a 
basement or just stuck alone and feeling afraid and all those things. So that I really wanted to, to be in service to all of you who are feeling that way. Um, and so I wanted to bring in also the um, uh, a story that uh, a woman called Joanna Macy, some of you might know her. She uh, talks a lot about the great turning, which is the moment I feel we're in. And why she started to talk about that is uh, a while back, she uh, is quite connected to Tibet and she, had a, she was studying with a Rinpoche who explained to her uh, an old story a prophecy from the 12th century from the Tibetan tradition um, where they, the prophecy was the world would be driven by greed and the barbarians would be running the show. Um, and, and there was a great moment where it could all implode and just as, as it's what we're facing today. We can either face uh, extinction and the planet goes on without us or we choose something else. And so the um, part of the prophecy is, well, what does it take then for us to make that choice, to choose something else? And the two things, the two components that the Rinpoche said were compassion, love, compassion, acceptance. And the second one is insight and um, wisdom. And I think about particularly the insight and the wisdom, again, going back to being in the room by yourself, being afraid, being on the social media all the time, listening to all this stuff. There's so much information that is actually mm, bringing you down. And so bringing your energy level down. And so what I want to suggest is develop your wisdom. When you're listening to something or if you're hearing a person tell you about something that is fear-based and is making you nervous and you're feeling out of sorts, you have actually the choice and use your wisdom to just avoid it, just to avoid that uh, completely. Because the whole point of what is going on right now is um, we have a choice, as that prophecy said, and in order to choose um, something better, uh, we have to raise our vibration collectively. And again, that means all of you sitting there by yourselves in these different places all over the world, it's you as well, you are part of this. And the more you can work with yourself to not be fearful, to see what that is and to release it, to, re to bring your personal vibration up, that affects all of us. And so collectively, if we raise that vibration, then we have a possibility of moving towards where we're talking about on this call today um, and not to um, vanquish ourselves and give in to what we've had so far. We move into love and compassion. Um, there's one more thing I'd like to say, and that is, um, uh, that's a poem that a friend of mine sent me just recently. And I think it perfectly captures the moment that we're in. Uh, a French um, poet, Tilha de Chardin is the name. I probably garbled it. It goes like this. The day will come when after harnessing space, the winds, the tides, gravitation. We shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jillian. Thank you, everybody. What a great evening I'm having here, and I hope everybody else is as well. I'm going to take a few questions that I've seen come through on our chat box here. And the first one I want to pose to Duncan, and it's not really, it's not really formed as a question, but I saw a lot of people saying, thank you for this comment. So I, I had to scroll back up to see what the comment was. So as uh, you know, Duncan is the indigenous elder that we are blessed to have on this call. So it says here, this movement to legalize the medicines needs more indigenous elders and indigenous women being invited in. Otherwise, I fear we will just perpetuate existing inequalities on who has access, who benefits from these medicines and how systems will actually change as a result. I mean, no offense, but look at the makeup of the audience watching right now. Um, I think there's another paragraph there, but maybe I'll just leave that there. Oftentimes, Duncan, the question of cultural appropriation comes up. Um, I'm featured in a, 
a movie about these medicines called Dosed, which we were touring for quite some time. And I sat on many panels and oftentimes that question came up. So kind of from, you know, the indigenous perspective, how do you feel about kind of that, that topic in general? Yes. Um, the, the topic, the, the whole topic of assimilation and acculturation um, is one that touches me and others very deeply. Um, and um, we're especially in a place now where at least the elders and the medicine women that I know speak um, almost frantically about the importance of inviting in anyone who wants to come in to the teachings and to the culture and for us to let go of our fear that doing that means we will lose something. Instead, what they say is if we practice giving this, not preaching it and jamming it down people's throats, but if we practice giving this, then all we'll do is receive back. And that now more than ever, it's important to realize that we're all on the wheel. And so there might be things from the south that draw me to the north, or there might be things from the west that draw me to the east. And now more than ever, the importance of being willing to give. And in giving, um, we don't reduce ourselves. We in fact acknowledge the oneness that we already are. Now I understand, I'm not representing all indigenous people with this. I know that there are many that don't agree with this and fair enough. Uh, I'm just sharing what I have been taught and what I, even more importantly, what, what I have found to be true, especially in the last while. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing that up, Trevor. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Duncan. Um, Salome, sure. uh, yeah, perfect. Wade, I'll, and, and Salome, you're next. Wade, as a resident anthropologist. I, I, I was just gonna say, I, I really enjoy and, and, and respect what Duncan just said. You know, um, cultures are never static. Uh, change is a one constant. Everybody always is dancing with new possibilities of life. In fact, one of the uh, detrimental conceits of even those who think of themselves as sympathetic to the plight of indigenous people is this idea that they're somehow fragile and delicate, quaint and colorful, yet destined to fade away as if they're failed attempts at keeping up. And we have to, in some kind of patronizing way, nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture. Change is no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And cultures are perfectly strong and perfectly capable of dealing with change. Let me, a perfect example in the realm of entheogenic plants. I mean, peyote um, passed to the Great Plains in an extraordinary rate of transfusion, uh, 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 diffusion rather, of, of basically one ethnicity a year for about a century from, from um, uh, its origins with the Tarahumara and the Vichol and then through to the Comanche and the Kiowa. And eventually it dissipated across all the way north to the Cree because why it offered a pharmacological shortcut to the distant metaphysical realms that have been traditionally reached on the plains by the pain of ordeal, the vision quest, uh, the ingestion of the toxic mescal beans. In other words, it, it, it offered in the wake of the collapse of Plains culture, a reaffirmation very much like the ghost dance with its messianic notion that if you wore these clothes, the bullets would not pierce your 
your your body and and the whites would disappear and the buffalo would repopulate the plains. It came apart in the wake of the collapse as a kind of reaffirmation. So you know, change is the one glorious constant of all cultures. And I, I who worked with and been a champion of the diverse uh, manifestations of the human spirit as brought into being by culture since I was a child um, and certainly all of my professional uh, life, but I've come almost to be questioning this very concept of indigenous, you know, because one of the things that happens is that when we define someone as indigenous versus non-indigenous, we set up a duality that in fact does not exist. And it adds extra credence to the conceit of the dominant society, because if the dominant society is in fact half of the world, oh, and these indigenous people are the other half, you know, then we maintain our, 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 our situation, if you will. The truth is there are 7,000 voices of humanity, 7,000 languages, 7,000 unique interpretations of reality in which the European tradition represents one narrow thread. And so this, this concern about the movement of, of cultural traits and practices concerns me less than the dynamics of power that, that move between cultures. I do think we have to be extremely careful about appropriation. I mean, there, there are elements to the uh, ubiquitous celebration of ayahuasca, uh, the transformation of Iquitos into the center where there, are, there may well be more practicing Shipibo shaman there than there ever existed in Shipibo people. It's gotten so huge. But the point is we do have to be careful of those kinds of appropriations, which is one of the reasons I try to always encourage people to get into the ethnographic literature, read these classic works and actually learn uh, what we do know through the, through the extraordinary work of incredible self-sacrificing anthropologists who spent two and three years. I have a friend of mine who spent two and a half, three years with an with a incredible society in southeastern Peru. The plane was coming to pick him up and he was studying shamanism and he just realized after three and a half years he hadn't got it. So he blew off the plane and went back into the forest for a year. I mean, these people are not exploiters of indigenous people. These are individuals who, from many ethnicities, who set themselves up as conduits that allow that incredible wisdom and knowledge to be, to be distilled in documents that can be um, be, be sourced by, by people all, all over the world. So I, I really liked what Duncan can say, said. I mean, to me, the question isn't about uh, uh, the, 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 the exotic other and the dominant world. It's, it's what kind of world do we all want to live in? How are we going to create a world, uh, a multicultural world of pluralism where every voice is heard, where people are not seen as vestigial elements of the human experience whereby every indigenous culture has a place at the table of human wisdom. Every culture deserve, has something to say and each deserve to be heard. The other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being us. Each is a unique answer to a fundamental <laughs> question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices of humanity. And of those voices, fully half are not being taught to children. So we're living through an era where by definition, half of humanity's knowledge, spiritual knowledge, ecological knowledge, philosophical knowledge, practical knowledge is at risk. So let's not waste time worrying about indigeneity or identity or who's, let's get on with the collective need to recognize that all of us have a right to exist. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard because this is the ultimate mission of anthropology to make the world safe for human differences. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. Thank you, Wade. I'd like to say Wonderful. something. Could I, I, I put Salome on deck there. So let's hear from her next. And Salome, I wanted to, to okay. hear your perspective on this question as well as you kind of left a bit of a cliffhanger in your last uh, uh, time up speaking that you might have something else to share with us. So I wanted to make sure we heard from that. Um, it's, it's about quarter to six Pacific standard time right now. We did say we'd finish at six. Are, is everybody on the panel okay with going a few minutes over if we're okay? We still have 800 people watching. Thanks sure. everybody. 
I, yeah. I, I'm going to have to hang up right at six. Okay. Yeah, I'm afraid I am too, Trevor. Um, I okay. could maybe stay on for a few minutes, but I've got something I've got to do. With, uh, okay, good stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll play it by ear. Salome, if we can unmute her. There thank we you. go. Thank you, Duncan, and thank you, Wade. I um, I also have to agree. I feel that at the point that we are, after feeling that we are not just this body and having enough access, that we have traveled through many lifetimes um, to be here, um, this container does not fully represent what is truly here. And so I am so grateful to elders like Duncan and other indigenous holders of the traditions in this lifetime who are opening up, who are sharing in this generous way, who are trusting that this is what spirit is asking um, to, for us to share. That really touched my heart. And um, for Wade, who's worked with indigenous individuals throughout so many years, and to say that, yes, in some ways, that that is not, that's creating duality. So I would have to agree. And um, my mentor, Bruce Taylor, who has helped me very much integrate all of the different journeys of ayahuasca that I've had, he has committed himself to going beyond the conditioned mind. And I feel that we have an incredible, again, I say this um, opportunity for alignment, for attunement, for enlightenment, to know that we are not this form and the attachment that we have to this form creates a lot of division. So this is our chance to go beyond and to really feel just in this moment, what is present. We're all beautiful mosaic pieces of that presence, the I am. And the more and more I feel that we can do that work to not identify with our form, our emotions, even though emotions are guides, with our thoughts especially, then we can allow that presence to come in that can truly guide us. Because as Dennis said, we are not in charge of this. I've, I've felt it so much in the reverence of, of the earth and the power that she holds. And It's beyond, it's beyond anything. I'm sure many of you have felt it in ceremonies and in your day-to-day -day life. It's beyond anything that we have a, a, even a, can really hold that much of an understanding of. Um, I remember my DMT experience where I just felt the hand of God on my back and all I could do was just be in prayer, forehead to the ground in, in awe. There were no words and I, I'm inviting myself to step more and more into that presence of space. And it does require, as Jillian said, a lot of compassion and empathy to connect. Um, the cliffhanger that you mentioned. So I, I just feel that um, the geopolitical situation. <clears throat> so just very briefly, um, as we go into close to the two Celsius marker of, of heating, um, what could happen is that the areas around the equator, the subtropical, tropical areas, and I'm quoting a lot of this from Dr. Gwaine Dyer, who's the author, he's a journalist, the author of Climate Wars. He, uh, it's fascinating um, to see what potentially could happen in the next two to five years. And so climate refugees, what we could see from Mexico as the droughts and the crops start to fail, the movement of migration up north, and the wall for me that President Trump has built was never about immigration for me. It was deeply about something else. And so with this division, there is one piece. And then when you look at Europe, the countries that were impacted the most by COVID-19, Italy, Spain, and Greece, again, their climate and what happens. Talking about the, the belt in China and every country that produces rice and wheat um, we know that rice as a form in, in uh, germination cannot, it, there's a small window. And if that heat increases too much, it will not be able to germinate. So we are talking about serious situation that we are facing as a, as a humanity. And um, again, Canada and the US 
a lot of issues around water, the lakes, water wars, India and Pakistan, the Indus River that runs down. Those are two countries with, with weaponry and missiles. And so I just pray, and this is where the prayer comes in so strong. And I visualize in my prayers, a blanket of white light around the, the globe and that every single 7.7 .7 billion brothers and sisters that we have will be held in this light and will will return to this light of protection that we are. And so that is my prayer. And I hope that we can, as the Canadian Psychedelic Association and other prayer circles to come together and sit together like the indigenous have for thousands of years, like the Buddhists have had, and to pray for our brothers and sisters and ourselves. And if a block comes up again, we clear that um, through this prayer and through this devotion to the super soul that we are here to be in service of. Um, and I, yeah, I will, I will uh, finish on that. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you, Salome. Um, we are going to do our best to wrap it up at six o'clock here. And uh, Dennis, you had a few words to say there. Well, I just, I just, thank you, Salima. That's, uh, thank you for expressing that. I think you've pointed up a number of the challenges that we're going to face. I think that this is what the 21st century is going to be about, you know, and we're beginning to see the foreshadowing that age of the 21st century may be an age of pandemics. And it is largely a result of climate change that that is happening. So all of these things are happening, but that isn't primarily what I wanted to say. I wanted to say a couple of things. I appreciated Duncan's sentiments about the indigenous people and the, the, the notion that they don't view this, they don't view the sacred medicines as their property. I don't think they have that really in their mindset. They have been the stewards and protectors of the plants up until now, and we should be grateful for that. We are grateful that they took that on. But really, every we are all indigenous. We're all indigenous to earth. And there may be 7,000 cultures. There may be many, many different people and point of view, but at the end, we're a species, we're, the, we're earthlings. And we are the indigenous people of earth. And I think that we need to start trying to interiorize that perspective. We're all in this boat together. And the boat is the earth and the boat is small. The boat is sinking, the boat is on fire. It's all hands on deck, people. We've got to get a handle on this before it's too late. And it's very easy to despair. Uh, I'm certainly uh, prone to that myself in my darker moments, but I also think it's important to remember no matter how bad it seems, no matter what is happening, no matter how dark it seems, it's important to remember two things. One is whatever is happening is exactly what is supposed to be happening at this point in the universe. The universe is unfolding exactly as it's supposed to. The other point is we need to remember how little we know. There is no room for arrogance. We have to remind ourselves that we have only a slight, a very small, piece of the full picture and we don't know what is what is going on you know there's no room for arrogance we can be proud of our science that's wonderful proud of other accomplishments that we've had but they are pathetic in terms of <laughs> the totality of what there is to know so a certain amount of humility is good and optimism in a certain way just knowing that in the same way that you might surrender to plant medicines, we have to surrender to what's happening. Not that we can't try and mitigate it, but we have to believe in our hearts that what is happening is happening for a reason. And this is the manifestation of the intelligence in nature. So that's that's my two cents worth. I'll lower my 
my hand thing. Beautiful. Now. Can you, um, I'm just going to, we are going to wrap up here very quickly, Dennis, while you're up there. Could you just let people know how they might find you or get in touch with you or any uh, social media or anything? Or uh, sure. They can, they uh, I'll put it in the chat box. Perfect. And I'll ask yeah. everybody else to do the same. Yeah. And uh, if anyone wants to say anything about that, that I just wanted to plug a couple things again something that's so important is the decriminalizednature.ca website. If you can please leave your email address in there, we have a petition that is going to launch in just a couple days and we need your help to make it go viral. We want to make a real impact with this petition to decriminalize all plant medicines. So please help us out there. Please Become a friend of the CPA. The Canadian Psychedelic Association launched today. You are a part of it. If you want to see more content like this, if you want to see more policy changes, which we're very focused upon, if you want to make these more these medicines available to everyone, including underserved populations, uh, 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 projects that's near and dear to my heart that I've been working on for decades now is the Underserved Populations Project to make sure that people who arguably need these medicines most as they become available, get access to them. So by becoming a friend of the CPA, you in, to do that, you go to psychedelicassociation.net. You can join through there. You can support this webinar series. You can support the decriminalization initiative. And then you will get 15% off the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, which I see Stephen Gray is here as well. Thanks for showing up, Stephen. And Mark Carone has generously offered the 15% off, as well as free access to the Spirit Plant Medicine website for three months. We also get 15% off the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum that uh, Kevin and Pauline have been putting together for so many years. It's such a great event. It is coming up in the fall. And you also get 20% off the Catalyst Calgary Conference. And David is on here as well, David Harder and Tarzi have been putting to get that together with their great team, which has now moved completely online. So you get at least a hundred bucks worth of value for helping out the Canadian Psychedelic Association. And we're going to keep finding benefits to send you as well as eventually open up a larger professional membership. We're really with the CPA focused on legitimizing these medicines and not only legitimizing it, but ushering it in in a good, in a good way, having these conversations around um, appropriation as an example that came up today, making sure that we're well informed on all angles. So there's a whole bunch of people I want to quickly thank. Jason from Stream of Consciousness, who's been helping us incredibly. He's also going to be streaming the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum. Mark at Conscious Living Network, he's been fielding questions for us and has been very generous. Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum, thank Thanks to them. Thanks to the Catalyst Calgary Conference. Thanks to Numinous Wellness Incorporated, who have helped the Canadian Psychedelic Association get off the ground. The Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, the Conscious Living Network. Uh, thanks to all the supporters of this petition so far, including Dr. Gabor Mate, Wade Davis, Dennis McKenna, Robert Laurie, John Conroy, and Brianna Morgan, and Paul Manley, the Nanaimo MP who's sponsoring this. Uh, thank you to all the CPA founding members. This has been in the works for almost a year now. And there have been a lot of working groups, a lot of people who have dedicated a lot of time in getting this thing this far. And it still feels like we've launched a, a rocket ship and are building it midair, but we're, we're getting <laughs> close and it's, it's really turned into a, a beautiful thing. And I think it's going to continue to flower. So, so thank you to all those early people. You know who you are who helped us out and committed yourself to the working groups. We've done a lot of work on this. And especially thank you to the, the founding board of directors, the steering committee that has met week after week after week to try and make this happen, including, uh, you can see all their pictures on the Psychedelic Association website, but Helen Loshley, Loshney, Dr. Pam Crisco, Ian Michael Hebert, Kate Browning, Dr. Ray St. Arnaud, Jillian Maxwell, Richard Kay, Salome Tabrizi and Pascal Tremblay, who he, he built that CPA website. He has been 
he so dedicated to making this thing happen. He wouldn't have been able to do this without all his technical know-how. So thank you so much, Pascal. Um, and thank you to you. Yes, thank, thank, you. You, thank you, Trevor. Amazing skills yes. thank you and your so commitment. Much, oh, thank thank you. you. So thank you to all our relations. We're really standing on the shoulder of giants here. Please consider becoming a friend of the CPA. That will help us tremendously. Go to that decriminalization nature petition. And I'll finish. I saw one of the comments there. Somebody said they'd like to hear from me on some of these topics. So maybe we'll just quickly wrap it up with what I would encourage everybody to do is ground themselves so they don't burst into tears, but to have faith. And when I talk about faith, I'm not talking about faith in some bearded person in the sky. I'm talking about faith as an operating principle, faith as the opposite of fear. Fear is just the expectation of a shitty thing to come. It's just an expectation. We, we don't know for sure what's going to happen, but we're expecting the worst. Faith is just the polar opposite of that. Faith is just an expectation as well, but faith is an expectation of a really good thing to come. So in these times of transition and this time, unlike any of us have faced before, let's have faith because these are often self-fulfilling prophecies. We get what we focus upon. That's quantum mechanics. That's, that's, that's the rules of life is you get what you focus upon. So right now, all of you just spent two hours focusing on some of the best information you could for the world. So please just keep doing that. Keep being who you are. Keep growing. Keep learning. Thank you to everyone for coming here. Especially thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thanks, all Trevor. Relations. Thanks, everyone. All my relations. Many blessings to you all. Thank you so Thanks, very Martin. much. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night, Trevor. Good night, Salome. Good night. Dennis, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. my Thank lovely you, panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. My Thank goodness. You. All right. Many blessings. Thank you. Spread the word. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Dennis. Somebody Bye, end Salome. this thing. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I can.